Christine. Hi, Christine. It is so good. Welcome to my new stuff. It is so good. You guys are all of me in California, eh? That's right. We are in California. Wow, that's so awesome. I wish I was in California. It's pretty cold up here. I'm in I'm in Canada, so yeah. Where, which Different part of Canada? Color. Where in Canada are you, Justine? I'm all the way out east, as far east in North America as you can get, even past New York. If you go all the way up towards um, the Arctic, I'm just actually under that. So I'm on an island called Newfoundland. Um, it's pretty cold up here, but it's it's beautiful during the summer. So <laughs> that's why you stick around. That's wonderful. So, crew, we read the article that Justine wrote. If you go ahead and turn over to page 20, I think, you can see where she is in the world. There's Newfoundland. There's Labrador. You are really, really far east, aren't you? I am. I'm so far east that literally if I want to go fishing and catch a fish for my dinner, I can go do that. There's there's a lot of fish around the island. There's a lot of uh, little birds, like called puffins. Have you guys seen puffins before? Yeah. 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 Two, they live two hours away from me, so it's a quick little drive to go and see them. Uh, we also have whales in the water, it's jumping out. Uh, if you go sit by the ocean, yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool place. That is super exciting. Well, Justine, we really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. We, we've been um, excited to, to talk with you. We're actually launching today our inquiry into how we can reduce marine debris entering our oceans. And we saw that you have a question that sounds very similar. How can you reduce plastic going into the oceans? Can you talk oh, to us about that? How we can prevent it. Yeah. yeah. So there's plenty of ways that we can all do our part, whether we live in California like you guys, or if I'm all the way out on the East Coast of Canada. What we want to do with plastic is we want to catch it when it's nice and big. So what I study sometimes, you guys saw like the article how I study these tiny little pieces of plastic, right? Yeah, microplastics. Microplastics, yeah, exactly. So like some of the samples uh, in the lab, for example, are really, really tiny. They're like, these guys, if anyone can guess what these are, they're microplastics, exactly. But these used to be part of uh, styrofoam cups and plates that you have at parties and stuff like that. So before they get super tiny in the environment, the best way to deal with them is not to use them in general. Because if you can say no to plastic, that's a good way. Or you can just make sure that they go properly in the garbage instead of littering and throwing it on the beach. You want to make sure they don't break down into small pieces of plastic. So, yeah, what you guys are doing is awesome. I've heard so much good work uh, from your class. Mr. Bethany talks very, very highly of you guys. That's because they're pretty awesome, and it's a great topic. Right. Oh, wonderful. So, Justine, do you want to do you want to tell us a little about your work? I know we have some questions that we'd love to ask you, but we really want to hear from you about things that you've learned or maybe tips or tricks, because we actually start a collection of data today. We're going out with our quad rats, like we saw in your article, and... You know, we're here to listen and learn from you. That's fantastic. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy you guys have your, your field work starting soon. You're, you're real scientists right, already. Um, so a little bit about myself first. Um, you can tell I talk, kind of talk funny. That's, again, because I live in Canada. We have a bit of an accent. Um, so I grew up in Canada's largest city. So it's kind of like your version of New York. Um, it's called Toronto. And it's a really big city that doesn't have an ocean near it. And when I was growing up, I was always in love with this idea of the ocean. And because it gets really cold in Canada, a lot of Canadians go down to Florida, if you know where that is, with like all the really warm beaches. And I went to Florida for my first time when I was five years old. And that's where I fell in love with the ocean. And ever since then, I've been really concerned about how we're treating our ocean, right? You know how we clean up in our houses and we take out our garbage when it gets too dirty and we give it a good clean? We haven't really been doing a good job of taking care of our oceans the same way we do our houses. And ever since I fell in love with the ocean, I've been really interested in learning more about the animals that live there and going on these wild field trips, basically. So, like, you, you know how you folks have like, field trips for class? A biologist's field trip is packing up your helicopter, putting all your supplies that you need for a few months, and heading up to the animal houses and basically hang out with them for the summer and get to know them and study them and research them and ask really cool questions. So it's almost like going to like a museum, uh, but you're actually like in the exhibit and you're like 
in the animal's house and you're basically playing around with them for a while. So ever since, you know, I kind of got into school, I've always fallen in love with that idea of studying and with these field trips. It's been a great way to not only be a nerd and, you know, study all these really cool animals, but also go visit them and actively learn and collect all that information, like what you, you folks are going to do in the school guide. So I, I think you saw from my article that I went all the way up to the Arctic one summer, and this is where I hung up. Yeah, so I hung out with birds for six weeks, literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, I couldn't call my parents if I wanted to because there was no cell phone access. My cell phone didn't work. Um, we were eating sardines and crackers and stuff like that, so it was really far out. And this is where I learned a lot about plastic pollution, because even though I was all the way up north um, in a place where I, could, I couldn't even use my cell phone, um, I saw plastic pollution from people. And this made me really sad, because I want to make sure that you know these animals have a good house to live in, that it's not dirty, that they don't have to live with more garbage. So ever since then, I've been studying plastic pollution in animals' houses, basically. And this is why I live on the eastern coast of Canada, because there's a beautiful ocean out here, and it gives me a great chance to literally hit the beaches and go and study what kinds of garbage are ending up on our shoreline. So my, my field trips, every month I go out to the beach, and basically I count the different types of garbage. So all the way from microplastics to, if anyone can guess what this is, Toy truck. Toy truck. Yeah, toy truck. And actually, we find a lot of toy tires all over the beaches, too. We find real tires, toy tires. Um, and this is the fun part of being like a garbage detective it, because it's a big guessing game. Every time we go out to the beach, we never know what we're going to find. So that's basically what I'm doing with my job now. I hit the beaches and I pick up garbage, but I'm trying to do it in a way that we can make sure that we make animals' houses cleaner for the future and we give them a better place to live. So that yeah, that's, that's a little cool. bit about myself. Sure. Justine, is that toy truck like the most unusual piece of trash you found? Or have you found things oh, that are even... Oh, we're getting into them? this one. Actually, we find a lot of toy trucks and a lot of toys. So like, what's funny is I found a toy from when I was growing up. And I'm like, I'm a little older, right? So like, I found it from the 1990s. There was a toy that was completely intact. And it was, it made me really sad because I thought, oh my gosh, like I played with this when I was five years old and it's still around. So we find toys sometimes. We find really big pieces of garbage like this. Whoa. So, look, I know that this is a really weird piece um, when people, when fishermen, for example, catch fish, they have to keep it cold, otherwise so the fish doesn't go bad. So this is part of a big box that's used to keep fish cold. So there's a whole bunch of different kinds of garbage that you can find on the beaches. Anywhere from toys to fishing gear. Um, we found some bags that came all the way from Europe, from Spain, which is a long way to come. It came all the way across the Atlantic, these bags from Spain. So plastic, like, I'm sure that, that you scientists already know that plastic can travel long distances, and they don't know boundaries. Um, another thing, too, that we come across sometimes are uh, marbles, glass marbles, and I've been able to date them to 50 years old. So these marbles have fallen in the ocean, and they've just been hanging around for all this time. Is anybody, so, is anybody wondering... Wait, where do you find a marble? Because wouldn't it float or would it sink? What, what, which would it do? So marbles are weird because they uh, they sometimes have little air pockets in between, like the older ones. So you guys know like glass marbles, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah so these ones are really, really old. They've been in the ocean for so long that you can tell they're all beat up. And like, have you guys ever found sea glass? Yeah. 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 Yes. All the ones, right? All the different colors and the cool shapes. So we find a lot of glass and marbles, which is really weird because you don't know how long they stick around in the ocean for because they got so beat up with time. But yeah, we find all sorts of weird things. But it's pretty cool because if you look at garbage, sometimes like this car, for example, it's all beat up and gross. But if you look at it on a beach, it kind of it looks beautiful in a way if you take it off and 
you can put it on a mantle or you can make art out of it. And a lot of people all over the world are taking things like this and making big art pieces um, in order to give the plastic a new life and raise awareness on how to make sure pollution doesn't happen. That's wonderful. Has anyone been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium? Have you gone to the exhibit with all of the sea creatures made out of plastic waste? It's it's over it's over it's still there. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, there's some beautiful artwork made out of what people would call trash, right? So, what do you want to say? Or what would you like to ask? Uh, in Disney, there's uh, the cars ride. There's a bunch of glass bottles. Absolutely, glass is one of those durable products just like plastic. It's amazing how it can cross an ocean, get pounded by waves, be around for years and years, like from the 90s, and still be recognizable. That's amazing. And, and that's the thing is like, uh, so when I go and I hit these beaches, a lot, a lot, a lot, what I find is plastic. So that's the main type of material there. But when you think about it, a lot, humans have materials made out of a lot of different things. Like this ruler, for example, is metal, and the table I'm sitting on right now is, is wood. Um, all this is considered like different types of materials, and sometimes if they end up in the ocean, that counts as debris. So even though I study plastic pollution, there's also like a ton of different materials like glass, metal, wood, that all come from people. And that's why it's really important to track all these materials and, you know, see where they're ending up. Are they being disposed in places they're supposed to be going? Or are they ending up in the environment without anyone really knowing about it? So, sea glass actually is, is good for the environment, to be honest with you. Uh, because glass is made out of sand. They take a whole bunch of sand and they heat it up really, really hot. And when it gets put into the ocean, it rubs and rubs and rubs against the waves and the rocks, and it eventually becomes sand again. So some materials are actually better for the environment than others. So plastic isn't so good. Plastic releases a lot of chemicals, um, and over time it breaks down, and it can actually harm the animals that eat those plastics. But glass is a little safer. So. Interesting. Um, we have some questions we definitely would like to ask you. Oh, for sure. One of the things that you said that really stood out the most, though, was that the best way to avoid getting plastic in the ocean is to avoid using it. And it seemed like the other thing that you said that really stood out was that, and Jenna Jambach talks about this, about containment. If plastic will be used, we want to grab it when it's big, before it gets mismanaged or floats away. Yeah. Um, are there any tips that you would give these students before we go out and do field work today with our quad rats and looking for the personality of the trash on our own campus? Because you talked about the personality of the beaches. You know, what, what would you suggest for us to maybe do as student scientists, as citizen scientists here in California? That's great. that's a great question. So, like, yeah, catching that garbage when it's big is really useful. You want to make sure that it doesn't have access. You want to cut off the garbage out of source before it hits the waterways. So, um, before plastic ends up on the beach, a lot of the time it goes on like a highway through rivers. So rivers are one big highway to the ocean, basically. And you want to make sure that plastic gets cut off before it goes on the highway. Because once plastic is in the water, it can cause a lot of damage. So when you guys are out in the field and you're collecting data, what you want to do is start to think about, where am I finding this plastic? Is it near a waterway or is it far away? And if you guys can have an idea of how to map how that garbage ends up near that highway, that could be really useful for maybe putting a garbage can there so that you know that garbage doesn't have a way to go into fresh water and rivers and sewer systems and stuff like that. And the best way to really reduce plastic pollution is not use it as much. And I know it's really, really, really hard because a lot of stuff is made up of plastic, but there's all simple steps that we can take. Things like not using plastic bags, and you know, using more renewable products that you can use over and over again. That, if everybody can take those steps forward, you can make have a really good impact um, across the country and even across the world. So those are definitely steps that everyone in this room can take. And I know you guys aren't grocery shopping and you're not doing the shopping, but if you tell your parents all about uh, plastics and how you know they can cause harm to the world, 
um, it'll be a good first step to really kind of change uh, your family life and attitudes and things like that. Those are, those are great tips, Christine. Kind of makes me wonder when you're talking, kind of makes me wonder if plastic gets into rivers and goes to oceans, how does it get into a river in the first place? And that's really something that we're going to want to try and explore and understand. Have you figured out how plastic gets into rivers where you are? Is that something you, you've explored? So that's a, that's a great question. Actually, a lot of the rivers, it's hard to tell in our area because everything, it's, we're a little different than California. California is nice because your seasons are pretty uniform, right? Like, you don't really have these drastic changes in Canada. For springs, for example, when you know when I hit the beach and I do my survey work, when we started our surveys on one beach, there was a tiny, tiny little creek that was running through our uh, beach uh, area, and within one year, that little creek turned into a massive river. It like literally took up two doorways, and it's really deep, and we can't even cross it anymore uh, because it just got so big, and every, the weather just changes so quickly over here. So to study freshwater is a little more challenging for us. Um, we know that a lot of the times that plastic is coming from areas where a lot of people live. Um, if there's a big city around, sometimes plastic will get caught in those rivers, and that's where you're going to find the most plastic pollution in the ocean. So, yeah, we haven't really studied the rivers out here, just because it's a bit trickier, but we're hoping to in the future. Interesting. So it sounds like it rains kind of all the time, off and on. Where you are, is that right? I beg your pardon? I said it sounds like it kind of rains all the time off and on where you are. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of uh, rain, a lot of snow in the winter, and yeah, it's it's quite, uh, there's a lot of uh, precip precipitation and water in general, so. Very good. Crew, uh, here in California, when does our rain get to a start? Uh, November-ish through about when? January-ish, February-ish, right? And then it starts to get dry. And then we've got that nice, long, hot summer. And then fall. So we're, we're in that transition phase right now. We had rain two days this week. So. Justine, awesome. you share some wonderful information. Could we maybe ask you some questions that we've generated? Oh, for sure. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to answer. Can, can you hear me OK? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So the first question we had was, what's the most common way that trash gets into the ocean? And I think you've already said rivers is one of them. Are there mm -hmm. other ways that's common for trash to get into oceans? Um, sorry, what was the, the last part of that one? You said, uh, you said that rivers bring a lot of trash into oceans. Are there other ways that you see besides rivers that trash gets into oceans? Yeah, so really a lot of the times river does put a lot of plastic in the ocean because when you think of rivers like highways, they run all over the place like they can go all the way, like, for example, you know, like the Mississippi River in the U.S. It goes all the way from the north all the way down to the south. So there's plenty of opportunities for garbage uh, to kind of get picked up along the way and put in the ocean. Where I live, um, there's a lot of people who actually go fishing for a living, and they catch a lot of fish. And that's how people make their money is they rely on the ocean to feed them and to uh, sell their fish at market. So sometimes in places like where I live, uh, a lot of plastic actually enters the ocean, not from rivers, but usually from when people are fishing. And because when I, I mentioned that you know, the weather gets really, really harsh, like in the winters, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of snow, things get lost at sea. And it's actually quite common because um, fishermen can't really control it because it's just the conditions are so harsh. So sometimes garbage of plastics, people can lose them by accident. They, they don't mean to... You know, they don't throw garbage bags over their boat. But what happens is um, their gear and their equipment get lost. And have, have any of you, when you go to beaches, uh, seen fishing rope? I've seen fishing yeah? Line, yeah. Big, big, long lines. Yeah, so like a lot of garbage is actually coming from those fishing ropes. So that's another way plastic can enter the environment. Interesting. And we wouldn't really have that here in Elk Road because we're in the land. Um, who asked this question? How long? Who asked the second question here? Can we get you to ask this? Zay, would you mind asking this question to Christina in a nice, loud voice? How long have you done your job? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I technically started, <laughs> I would probably say I started 10 years ago. 
Yeah, I consider when I was in school, um, so after you go to high school, you go to college. That's when I consider when I first started my job uh, because at that time, even though I was still in school like you guys, taking notes and listening to your teacher and your professors, things like that, um, I started already thinking about what kind of projects I wanted to do. So I would say about 10 years, I've been doing like ocean stuff, the plastic research, um, about four years. So a long time. Oh, thank you. Well, nice question. This third question on our list. This question was this. Lena, would you like to go ahead? Maybe, maybe tell us just, just a tiny bit about what you want to do to get older. Go ahead and stand up. Could you ask that question nice and loud? Say it real loud, Lena. Yeah, really loud. <laughs> Shout it. Okay, she she wants to be a marine biologist when she grows up. Oh, that's awesome! Right on. It's it's a good it's a good area to study. Honestly, there's oceans everywhere in the world. Um, one thing with marine biology is a lot of people sometimes say you know whales and dolphins, and I think those animals are really cool. Don't get me wrong. Hold on. It's okay. She'll come back. You froze. You froze for just a second. Just for a Oh, are you here? Oh, you're there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you guys for me. I was scared. Yeah. Um, yeah. So marine biology, you can study whales and dolphins and all these big animals. But one really cool part of my job is that even though I don't study those animals, I can live in places and I can go on field trips to places where those animals live. And you can hang out with them. So when I went up to Greenland, for example, uh, you can see all the different wildlife and these really cool places. So marine biology lets you go go to some pretty awesome places. That's wonderful. Uh, Lena also had a, a, a follow-up question, which was, how yeah. um, how do you actually catch a little auk? How does that happen? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. So, okay, have you ever seen in cartoons when there's a cartoon character that booby traps someone with, like, a little rope? Or like in a cowboy movie where the guy is like this with his rope and like throws it on. So that's the lasso is what I used when I was in Greenland. So picture a big rocky cliff. And I would go, I would climb up all the way to the top and I would sit here. But then just underneath me, I would have this little noose. So it's just like a little um, line, basically just a, a piece of rope. And I would booby trap the rock. And I would sit up high with my binoculars, holding the other end of the string. And I would sit there with my binoculars, looking at that little booby trap. And I would wait, I, I kid you not, for like an hour until the bird would land on that rock. And I would have to wait for the exact second where that bird put one foot into the rope. And you didn't want to do two because you didn't want to hurt the bird when you pulled it. So you would have to wait for that exact moment when all the conditions were right and the bird had his little foot in that in that um, lasso, and then I would pull on it really tight, and then I would bring the bird up to me where I would grab him in my hand, and that's how I would catch them. So that's... it's a nice way because it doesn't stress out the animal too hard, and if you do it right, you can do it very quickly. That's amazing. And you had to do that, how many samples did you collect? 110. 110 times. <laughs> and you're talking yeah. about an hour maybe per bird. How many hours is that? It was a long time. Oh my yeah. gosh. So that's why it took six time. weeks. That's why it took six weeks, huh? It was a lot of hours waiting for poop. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. What's the next question? Justine, that's amazing. Who is the next yeah. question? Caitlin, go ahead and real loud, ask your question real loud and proud. How long did it take uh, to create uh, Sorry, guys. I, I, you, can you say that one more time really loud? The backpack trackers, how long did it take to make those? Or who, kind of who made them and how long did it take to make them? Because Oh, those ones are complicated. So, you know, it's funny because you have so much technology in your cell phones, right, and computers. And you would think it would be really easy to make trackers for animals that would you could buy anywhere and, you know, they would cost very little. But they're actually very expensive and you have to specially order them. So the trackers we were using, I think, were made in Poland. So all the way in Europe, they had to be specially manufactured. And when you work with wild animals and you put technology on them, 
they have to be super, super tiny. So if you see like this lighter, for example, if you take maybe this much, they're really tiny little capsules. It's almost like a big pill. Um, that's what you attach on the animal, and it has to weigh a certain amount, so you don't stress out the animal. So to make those, I would assume hours and hours and hours. Um, they cost, they're actually quite expensive. So it's basically one tracker was the cost of a computer. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and there were 20 trackers that got lost in the ocean. <laughs> so picture throwing 20 computers um, in the garbage, basically. Yeah, it's really hard. In wildlife biology, the moment you put technology on a wild animal, you need to picture in your mind that you write through that money out and you're never going to see those trackers again. If you can see, if you can find three trackers out of ten, that is amazing. You made a really good dent in getting data. So that means 70% of your trackers failed, and 30% of your trackers made it, and 30% is successful. Basically, yeah. That's like the rule of thumb. Where it's just like if you can get some data in that like 30% area, it's, it's a good job. So feeling feelings to be expected. Oh, yeah. And that's just the thing. Is it's like uh, for you, I guess you folks always hear about getting that perfect score on the test and doing amazing at school. Sometimes that doesn't happen in real life. And by sometimes, I mean not all, like it barely happens. Like in my job. I have to get used to things not working out because every time you put an experiment, especially when you're thousands of miles away from home, you have to picture that you're going to fail because you have to be able to cope with what happens if it doesn't work out. How can you problem solve your way out of it? That's a really great life lesson in addition to a science lesson. Um, can I ask this question? Good question. Yep. Take a look. You're going to Hey, Bruce, can you walk up a little bit closer to the, the laptop so she can hear you walking on the corner? Walk on up. There you go. We'll try to get real loud and proud. Get up closer, get up. Squeeze it by Luke. There you go. There you go. Go ahead, ask that question nice and loud. Um, oh. why, why, why do you go to the same beaches each time? That's a great question. So, visiting the beaches is really good because, okay, for example, every time you go home, like back to your parents' house after school, I bet if there was one day I came into your house and I changed how the furniture was laid out in your house, you would notice right away and be like, this crazy person came in and moved my furniture. That's exactly what biologists are looking for uh, when we look at long-term trends. We want to see the environment not only once, but we want to go back multiple times to see how it changes and how that furniture or, you know, that river in the middle of the beach kind of comes about and when it happens. Because with plastic pollution, you notice that there's not a lot of garbage um, every month of the year. Sometimes in the winter, for example, there's less garbage than we find during the summer. And that's really important to do is to go back to these beaches all the time and see how this garbage of plastic changes because that's how we can make better recommendations to um, people who make like laws to say like listen winters aren't important but we, summers are really important times to go in and do cleanups and monitor so getting all that information is, is you know part of my job even if it seems like why would you want to go back to the same place it's boring having that same field site where you can see those changes Super, super important. That is really interesting to hear. I, I just thought of a personality of a beach and how it can change just with the season. So the next question. Um, yeah, this question and one more. Joseph, could you stand up and could you really loud and proud talk to that laptop and ask just in your question? You want to, you want to walk up closer? But I want you to stand up right here. See, see if she can hear you. What do you like about your job? All right, I, um, I love the fact that I don't know what my job's going to give me next month. In terms of schedules and stuff, I find doing the same thing over and over and over a little boring. Um, I, like, I mean, years and years of working the same job. For me, I love the idea of if I have an idea of a project I want to do, I can propose it. 
and then I can go do it. And the whole part of traveling to all these beautiful places in the world um, is probably what really fuels my passion is that, you know, to go to the Arctic is very expensive. If you, have, if you go as a tourist, you have to make a lot of money to go up. But as a biologist, that's, you know, part of our job is that, you know, for three months of your, like for a couple months of the year, you're off to these really remote places of the planet and you get to basically just watch animals in their natural habitat. And that's a privilege for a lot of people. So that's probably like the favorite part of my job is the constantly changing bit, the lots of travel and, you know, hanging out with animals. That's exciting. Let's well, ask one more question if we could. And then we have a few more. Could, could we email you a couple of questions, Christine? Oh, yeah, of course. Please, okay. please, take your time. As many questions as you guys want. Wonderful. And we also have another thing that we can use. It's called Look Great. It's like a video recording tool. I'll send, mm. the, I'll send the link to you. That way you can just record a response to it if you want to, and then we can hear you and see you. But it's also easy for you to talk to it. Who has a last question that you're going to ask? <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I said custom responses. Right on. Yeah. Yay, yay. Oh, yeah. Lewis, do you want to walk up a little bit closer and ask my nice big loud voice this last question of last year's game? <clears throat> because we got some film work to come back after this, right? Yeah. This is exciting. Science is that work. Soon I'm going to have to come out and work with you. Oh, please. Um, Anytime. Yeah. We would love to have you out here. Oh, I'll take it. <laughs> Hi there. Um, how, have you ever saved a sea creature? Mm, that's a good question. I. My, I'm thinking of my earliest time I did that was when I was, it wasn't when I was a scientist formally, um, it was when I was down in Florida um, on vacation with my family, and it was when I was five years old. On the beaches in Florida around the summer, there's all these holes that begin to happen, right? Like really deep holes, and you're like, where's all this coming from? And one time we looked in a hole, and it was a whole bunch of turtle eggs. So at the time, that's when all the turtles hatched, the little babies, because the big mamas, they'll like lay the eggs in a big hole, they'll bury them. And then the babies are responsible for digging their hatching, digging themselves all the way out of those holes, and then running towards the ocean before they get eaten by seals. And one time when I was with my family, when I was five years old, uh, my mom and dad and I came across this big hole with a little tiny, tiny baby turtle, this big, it was so small. And I remember my dad, within a minute, scooped him up, and together we basically put him on the sand and we started running towards the ocean. And, you know, you're technically not supposed to help wild animals survive, but it was, we obviously had to do it. And, yeah, we videotaped uh, that baby turtle running towards the water and he went right into the ocean. So I think that was my earliest recollection of helping wildlife. But yeah, I, I try to help them whenever I can. If I see some duck, for example, in our backyard struggling, I'll always go out and let them handle it if I can. Justine, that's wonderful. We really, yeah. really appreciate your time. Um, no. We have a few more questions, like I said, we'll share with you, uh, either in an email or with Flipgrid, but is there anything that you'd like to say uh, or anything that you'd like to share with them before we leave? This is your chance. You don't get to talk to Nat Geo Explorer every single day, and she is one of our specialists. Wait, how do you make the backpacks? The back Sorry, what, the back what do they look like? Oh, what do they, they look like? What do they look like, the backpacks? They kind of like... Oh, the yeah, so they're like tiny little tubes. So if you picture like this pen, for example, if you make it like take this little black part, this is exactly what it looks like. But then you could break, like, if you had to break it open and look inside of it, it's super complicated because it's, like, a whole bunch of wires, and it's kind of like the inside of a computer, but super, super tiny. So, like, they're, like, little pills, really tiny. And what you do, you tape them on the animals. So, basically, if the animal is stress, stressed out and they don't like the trackers, they can take them off. I'm wondering, are the trackers made out of plastic? They are. Uh, so Plastic can be pretty helpful too, right? I mean, it's. Mm. <laughs> well, that's the thing is, is that when you look around, all of us, like, there is so much plastic from this pen to the top of my coffee mug. Even though my mug is reusable, the top is still plastic. You never forget about that. Um, plastic is really, it's a great material and it's super helpful. 
But right now, our problem with plastic is we're just making too much of it. And we don't have to throw it out every time we use it once, right? We, we can do better than that. We want to make sure the animals have a clean house. That seems like a really important message, that plastic is helpful and useful, but the fact that we're making so much, maybe too much, and then how we dispose of it. Those seems to be like really important things. You're not saying we should get rid of all plastic. You're saying we should manage it more carefully. For sure. Yeah, and that's the thing is it's like, there's a, can you guys think of any way that we can stop using some type of plastic? Is there anything? Yeah? Um, my cousin used bamboo straws. Oh, right on. See, that's a good step in a good direction. That's like using one piece and then just using it a lot instead of having to use multiple straws. So there's a, there's a substitute. What's another substitute you can use for plastic besides a plastic straw, bamboo straw? What else do you think? Go ahead, gentlemen. Or Jason, excuse me. <laughs> Real loud, so she can hear you. Yep, speak loud. <laughs> you could use a reusable bag. Oh, that's a great idea. Reusable bag, absolutely. What else? Yeah, what do you say? Paper straws, bamboo Paper straws, straws, reusable bags. What other things? Sophia, and then uh, Daniel. What else? Wooden utensils, like I have. You could use that. Yeah. What else could you use? Daniel. Were you going to say yeah. wooden utensils as well? T, what would you say? Plastic utensil. A, a reusable plastic utensil. Who, who see my green sport, my plastic sport, right? I use it every single day in my lunch. Let's get one more. Hope, what would you say? Reusable metal water bottle. What about reusable plastic water bottle? Is that okay too? Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Hey, Justine, do you have like a favorite reusable thing that you have that you use like constantly, your go-to favorite thing? So this travel mug, like you can see it's all beat up and it's scratched and it's fallen from like, I think some, I threw it out a window or it fell out of a window once. Um, I have brought this mug all the way to the Arctic in Norway. I brought it, I think it was a 24 hour flight to get there. So I brought it 24 hours on an airplane. I brought it with me for this one trip I was there for, it was a, a program. And it was funny because people in Norway didn't even bring their mugs. And I was so like, why wouldn't you bring a mug? You're so close, this is your home. And yeah, this mug has been very well traveled. So this mug goes everywhere with me. Yeah. It's good to use reusable things. Honestly, it helps to bring you know, when people see you use the same thing over and over, it makes an impact. And you might not know it, um, but if you use that. It's okay, just wait. Ah, uh, thank you, Justine. This, uh, yeah. this, is, this is my baby. I've taken this all the way. Oh, yeah, this, this one might look familiar. Do you remember this one from Washington? Okay, over yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's that, Mr. Mr. Bentley is a legend at National Geographic. <laughs> Everybody loves him there. Oh, you very cool teacher. You are very kind. I appreciate your time. You have been wonderful today. Hey, you know, crew, we should give her a big PBL work single pop. That would be on the one pop. On three, that would be a one, two, three. Let's go a round of applause, though, too. We can go that as well. You ready? Round of applause. On three, two, one. That was perfect. Justine, thank you oh, so wow. much. You were wonderful. Say goodbye, guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, friend. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Oh, you guys were wonderful. So cool. Okay. Ah, I'm all excited. I'm ready to go do field work, but you know what? We're going to do one thing first. There's a really important thing to do when you have something big and powerful and important that goes on. Let me hear you say act. Act. Reflect. Reflect. Re Re reflect. I'm going to ask you to take a minute, take a couple deep breaths. We're going to reflect. I'm going to need you to get back to your desks. I'm going to need you to grab 
a Chromebook and a mouse. When we use Flipgrid as a tool, quiet hands, where do we always face? And I love the quiet hands. I love the quiet hands. Three says, where do we always face? The wall. Why are we facing the wall? Again, it's quiet hands. I'm not saying through. I don't want you to blurt out. Camille, what's one reason? Because your voice bounces back onto the wall and then back towards you. Voice bounces off the wall, bounces back to you. Who absorbs that nice sound? You. You're the squishy person with the squishy clothes, right? Could I get Jenny's group? Chromebooks. Could I get Brissette's group? Mice. You know what? We can put your desk back over here. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do some desks around today. It's okay. Could I get Lena's group? Chromebooks. Could I get Bennett's group? Mice.